Everyone, you can all hear me? Cool. Hope you've all had a nice break. Welcome to 2024. Anyone brave camping this, these holidays? Well, some people over there, good on you. I drove home yesterday, less than an hour, I think I experienced all four seasons. <laughs> so, <laughs> be quite a challenge. Um, I'll just commit this time to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share your word from Psalm 27. And I really pray you'd speak to us, Lord, as we dig into this chapter, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So I better turn this on. Psalms of the heart. So if you've read ahead of Psalm 27 or you know it, you'll know this, the answer to this question that I'm going to ask. If you could ask only one thing of the Lord for this year, what would it be? And if you haven't read through Psalm 27 already, you might be going, well, maybe resolve my work situation, <laughs> help me pay my bills for the year, deal with my, the difficult situation at home, whatever it might be. So we'll think about that question as we move forward. So Psalm 27 is a psalm of David. Who was David? A uh, number of things there on the slide. First thing I've got there is man after God's own heart. Psalms, I call Psalms the heart of the Bible. Proverbs is like the wisdom, but Psalms is the heart. In Psalms, we climb the mountains and we hit the valleys. The valleys of depression, despair, distress, and fear. And we climb the mountains in faith and encouragement and comfort. And David contributed 75 of those 150 Psalms. And probably another 20 or 30 were written by other people in his time frame. So he really contributed significantly to this part of Scripture. Where did he get his faith from? Well, last year we studied the book of Ruth. And uh, so he came from the line of Ruth and Boaz, those faithful two people. And certainly his father, Jesse, would be, was a faithful man. His brothers seemed to be a little bit of a mixed bag. Uh, but I'd also like to point out Psalm 86, verse 16. It says, David says, Lord, save me, for I serve you as did my mother. Mothers and fathers are so important for faith. This man, he had a strong faith right from a young age. You know, we, we, we see him sent out into the field as a shepherd. He wasn't an adult like we would be. Any 14, 13, 15 year olds here? You're off out in the field. Yeah, I saw some hands somewhere creep up. <laughs> We're sending you out the field for a few weeks, okay, and there's, there's some lions and bears have escaped from the local zoo, and there's no lights either, by the way. It sounds a bit strange of 13, 14-year-old being out in the fields but like that, but I read recently of a 14-year-old that went whaling on a whaling ship in the 1800s, and I thought, well. Uh, but he was a tough dude from a young age, and I've seen some pictures of David strumming his harm, harp, wearing a white outfit, sheep frolicking there, and it looks a little bit lame to me sometimes. So I've got my picture there with him facing a bear. I'd like to give you another little picture of him. If you know Rambo. <laughs> now, Rambo was a bit of a loner, and he didn't really trust the Lord, so different in that way. But David was, to me, perhaps like a Rambo. He was a tough dude. Think of a Navy SEAL. <laughs> you know, he took on armies and battles that we would not go near. Perhaps I'll read to you 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 17. And uh, so perhaps he was about 17, 18, 19 at this point, not quite old enough for war. And uh, he's visiting his brothers. And Goliath is there. And he says to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear, and he took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth, presumably with a slingshot and maybe some short sword. And it goes on further. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Brave young man, courageous. Acts 2 verse 30 also calls him a prophet. Psalm 51 is a classic that we go to when we sin. And 
Armies couldn't take him out, but you could say a woman did. <laughs> His flesh with Bathsheba. And then he was a worshipper. He wrote Psalms. He brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And so he was also a worshipper. And we hear that echoed in the book of Psalms. So that's David. Psalm 27, I've called it the Psalm of the Mature Believer. And I've broken it up here for you to give you a bit of an understanding before we read it. The first six verses, David is expressing certainty and faith in the face of fear. We don't know quite when David wrote this psalm. It's not clear. But perhaps it's after when he was a bit older. He'd been through a lot of battles. And he wanted to impart his, to his people confidence in the Lord. So that's the first six verses. But then he gets real about how we feel sometimes in 7 to 12. Where are you, God? So this is, you know, church on Sunday and then first day back at work. Oh my goodness, what have I got to deal with now? <laughs> Where are you, God? And then it finishes with some statements of faith. So, oops, I went way too fast then. I've seen other people do that. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing is that one thing. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter, of, in the shelter on the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies, all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry loud. Be gracious to me. Answer me. You said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O Lord, of God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on level paths because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and in the command. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Here's Psalm 27. So it speaks to fear. What brings fear to you? It isn't the fear of the Lord that the psalm is talking about, but that should drive us to the Lord for safety. It isn't fear of a burn, running into a building, burning building. Just don't. It's fear of the world, fear of people. And the, the world communicates fear. The news and social media, it brings fear. Governments can bring fear, to drive, use fear to drive behaviour. Cancel culture. Here's a good one. Fear of rejection. Am I good enough? Am I loved? Those difficult work situations. Or a simple thing like we don't ask questions in a group for fear of sounding stupid. Our past failures can instill fear in us and we don't step out. Here's a good one. We don't share the gospel for fear of rejection. Big one for me. Believers in other parts of the world fear for their lives, something we don't necessarily face but is very true of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. Does any of this relate to you? 
Some of it will somewhere. Maybe it's just fears you might face this year. It's a part of our life. I, have, um, I run a website, a Christian website for new Christians, and I receive a variety of emails from time to time. Uh, and sometimes I, I don't reply to a large number of them, but some of them I feel I should reply to. And I've dug out part of an email. We reworded it slightly. And so this is one, a real one, which I've taken part of. Somehow I managed to get a Bible. I used to read daily and hide it from my family. But one day, my mother saw the Bible. It's not a crime here to kill anyone in the name of religion. My family started watching me. And one day, they caught me reading it. I was terrified. I have no resources, but I leave my home because I don't know what they will do to me. Please guide me to live a secure life real email from someone and I can tell you it's a real difficult challenge for me to know how to reply to that email. I really don't ever think I have a good response but maybe Psalm 27 can help us a little although I don't know how you write Psalm 27 back in an, e back in an email <laughs> but these are real things. So let's get into the first verse The Lord is my light I actually do have the verse number there, but it's in blue and you can't read it. Can you on that slide? I'll learn from that. Psalm 27 verse 1. <laughs> so that my, all, all the verses might look like that. I'll just read the verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Three key ideas, light, salvation, and stronghold. And as we go through the psalm, you'll see I've grabbed three ideas from most of the verses. Uh, see the parallel ideas there, light and salvation versus stronghold? You could say that if we, have, if we are saved, we have our salvation, but not the light, not walking in the light of his word and so on, then perhaps we have a fairly fragile stronghold. On the same token, if we have light of God's word, we know the truth, we know perhaps how to be saved, but we're not saved, we don't have a stronghold. Uh, Salvation. I've, you'll see me, I've added the word deliverer there. And that's primarily because when we read the word salvation, we think of Jesus and our position since the cross. But David didn't have that. He had the promises, but he didn't have that salvation. And the Hebrew word for salvation can equally be transferred, translated to deliverer. Uh, so it just helps us think about David's situation by putting that word there. Stronghold could also be translated fortress, which I saw was in the word of the first song. Thank you. So, uh, a friend of mine summarised this whole psalm very well, Dr. Sean McEwen. If we are walking in the light of God's word and the warmth of his presence, we do not need to let fear get hold of our hearts. I love that. I think it's quite nicely put. Fear. Whom shall I fear? Look, many times the Bible says, do not fear, do not be anxious. And we need to take that command. It's almost a command, seriously. So, as we walk through the psalm, we'll try and work out how to do that. To help us understand the psalm a little bit more, I further give giving you a little, little structure. And there's a poetic structure called a chiasm. <coughs> And it has ideas that go A, B, C, D, C, B, A in reverse order. It's done in various ways. Uh, as I looked up chiasm amongst various scholars for this psalm, they kind of, some people had very different ideas about where to have some of the breaks. So I've broken it this way. And you'll see the first verse there. God is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold or deliverer. And those ideas ripple through the rest of the psalm. The words don't as such, but the ideas do. So we go stronghold, light, salvation, and in the middle part, and then back, deliver it, salvation, light, stronghold. So as you read the psalm, you might, and then the, the final verse, you might, that might help you understand it. This is verse 2 and 3. <laughs> In the fate of blue, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh. My adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, 
my heart shall not fear. The war rise against me, yet I will be confident. Three ideas in there that David says. My enemies stumble. My heart will not fear. I will be confident. Yet he's surrounded by armies. He's in an impossible situation. In the normal world, they would just take him out. Seems to me that the faith expressed in this verse was kind of unique to David and Israel. David and Israel had promises that if they remained faithful, God would save them in these situations. The Davidic covenant that David had promised the Messiah from his line. But for us, we are not the nation of Israel. So how does this relate to us? Still staying with that idea that God is my stronghold. We have promises just like David and Israel. But our promises are spiritual and eternal. And these are our stronghold. Here are some of those that I dug up from the word. Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always. The Spirit is within us. I sometimes wonder why we pray, be with us, Lord, or be with so-and-so, Lord, because he's with us always. He said he would never leave us or forsake us. So it's a good question to ask, why do we say, be with us, when he is with us? Nothing can separate you and I from his love. You are loved. You are lovable. Remember, we talked about rejection and reasons to fear. You are loved. You are lovable. Romans 12, 19, that's a good one. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When we feel like we're being attacked in whatever life situation we have, the Bible calls us to forgive and to bless our enemies. And yet we naturally feel not only fear, but maybe, but it's not fear, Lord. F-A-I-R, fear. <laughs> but the Lord says he'll take care of that. One day there'll be a balancing of the books. One day everyone will face the Lord. There's a promise. He'll sort out the vengeance. He'll take care of it. And an eternal life, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, Death is not the end of us. And it speaks of heaven in 1 Corinthians 2 9 being what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. God is prepared for those who love him. As we walk in our faith in Christ, these are unassailable promises for us. It's good to know them, have our eyes set on heavenly thoughts. Moving along, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord. So if you read Psalm 27, you knew what was coming, but what would be your one thing? Sometimes it's not this. Often it's not this. David's was to have a seeking heart. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. It will dwell in the house of the Lord. It will gaze upon his beauty inquire into his te- in his temple now the temple wasn't built then when David spoke the psalm of course he brought worship to Jerusalem and he planned for the temple to be built but it didn't exist yet and we don't have a physical temple Yet 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says we are the temple of God. So how would this relate to us? How do we dwell, gaze, and inquire? Well, this gives us a little clue because it's in the context of God is my light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. His word gives us wisdom, perspective, and guidance. Last year, I was uh, spending some time writing (coughs) some monologues where I get into the character of one of the characters in the Bible. And one of those was a guy from, a Baruch from the book of Jeremiah. And 
I was really trying to read Jeremiah each morning with my coffee, sit there and dwell and just think, what is Jeremiah thinking and feeling? Why is God doing what God is doing? I needed to get understanding. And I needed to just get closer to what was really happening so that I could portray that monologue with a little bit of reality. And it came to me a month or so ago that I was dwelling in the tent. I was dwelling in the Lord's house, sitting there, prayerfully reading his word. I think that's what we're called to do, all of us, to dwell in the word. And that's, remember it says Jesus said, I am the word. He also says, I am the light. What does it mean to gaze upon his beauty? Well, Isaiah 53, verse 3, says of Jesus prophetically when he walked this earth that he had no beauty that we should desire him. So what does it mean to, get, mean to gaze upon his beauty? What is his beauty? <clears throat> Put a little summary statement there that I think helpfully summarizes it. His holiness and love combined with his absolute power and knowledge and authority expressed in such incredible humility, grace, and sacrifice. Now you can dig in beyond that, but there's some thoughts to start you to think about the beauty of the Lord. There is no other God like him. And then and quiet in his temple really to me is just saying, dwelling in his word and coming back to that, having his word as a guide for us for daily, daily, daily life. What we do daily, how we take on the challenges that come our way. And we're not spending the time in the word today and tomorrow and the next day. In a month's time or three months' time, we, we might face a fearful situation. You're not suddenly going to open up his word and read it to try and catch up. Now is the time daily to spend time in that word. That is dwelling in his temple. That is dwelling in his light. God is our light. God is my deliverer. For he will hide me in the shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. That word shelter is the Hebrew word Sukkot. And for those who know, uh, there was a Feast of Tabernacles, a Feast of Sukkot, celebrated by the Jews in September, October, comes up to Yom Kippur. And they remember the protection and covering of the Lord when they wandered the desert for 40 years. And how do they celebrate Sukkot? They build these um, temporary structures without a roof because they're remembering that they had no roof over their heads as they walked through the desert. They're remembering the supply and the protection and the watching over that God did for them as they walked the desert. This is David's memory that God, even though things might be open to the world and the sky, he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me into the cover of his tent. So maybe the concept there is that in those days, if you were taken and welcomed into someone's tent that was their home effectively, they felt responsible to keep you safe. God wants to keep us safe. And then the rock, well, we know, you know Jesus is the rock. And that whole idea, lift me high upon the rock, has that idea that you're standing on a rock and maybe the lion's prowling around below, but he can't touch us. Just as Satan, you know, he's our accuser and Jesus is our defender. Where heart can be high upon the rock. And also I'd remind us that, there you go, sorry, I forgot to put that up there. Uh, that last verse, Matthew 7, 24 Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And just going back to verse 13 there, Colossians 1, you'll see he delivered us from the domain of darkness. Um, I want to comment on James 4, verse 7 and 1 John 1, 9. First of all, it says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee. It's not a matter of just resisting the devil. That's really doing things in our own strength. God is not your deliverer if you're doing it in your own strength. Uh, so I put those two verses together and think, when we are tempted by the enemy, when we're attacked, we need to submit to God. We need to take our heart, our lives, our thoughts to God, to the cross, and say, Lord, 
I can't do this. I need your strength. Too many Christians trying to be a good Christian without realizing our ultimate need is to rely on the Lord. And then we can resist the devil and he will flee. And then if that all fails, catch your, <laughs> thank you, Lord. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So if we are tempted, submit to God. I trust you, Lord. But if I still fall, he then says, confess your sins. He will forgive and cleanse. He is our deliverer in all ways. So then let's rejoice. Heads lifted up, offer sacrifices with shouts of joy. Sing to the Lord. Whoops, I did one too many. How do you show thankfulness? Because you've got an incredible saviour. Our salvation is secure. He has given us his spirit. He's with us always. He's given us his truth and his word. It's important to have a grateful heart, to give thanks for everything to God our Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's the first six verses. So now we have a little change in focus. So I've put it like, I'm just highlighting that change which we looked at at the beginning. But notice um, in the bottom of that slide there, you'll see in the first six verses we've been addressing God in the third person. He will hide me, he will conceal me, and he will lift me up. And now David's getting personal to God. You have said, your face do I seek. Teach me your way. So you might notice that as we progress. Verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me, answer me. Where are you, God? So David is conveying that he's lost confidence. He's feeling fear. Something we all feel, isn't it? It happens to us all no matter how strong our faith. And it's okay to be honest with God and with each other. Okay, the reality is that God allows us, I believe, to face situations for us to learn the truths of the first six verses. We learn them on Sunday, but we actually learn them in our hearts, I think, through daily life. If we read Matthew 6.25, it says, Do not be anxious about your life. Anxious, fear, worry, they're kind of related. We need to go journey through all the verses before that in that Sermon on the Mount. And the first verse, I think, is one of the most important. Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. We come to God and say, I don't have what it takes. I am poor in spirit. I need your spirit. I need your strength. And then we journey through those verses and we get to, do not be anxious about your life. Often we jump into that verse there and try and get some strength out of it. But I think there's a journey to get there. Verse 8 and 9. Be my deliverer. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. That Hebrew word there, that first word, seek, is plural. And the second one is singular. So God is addressing everyone. Seek my face, just like he wants everyone to be saved. But then it's a personal response. I do seek your face. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. What has David done that he feels that the Lord might be angry with him? Maybe it was the sin with Bathsheba. We don't know. But he's worried about that. What have they done? Oh, turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not. That feeling of rejection. O oh God of my salvation. And verse 10, For my father and my mother have forsaken me. Now we have no record that that actually happened. It may have done. But he's conveying that idea that those closest to his heart have forsaken him. But the Lord will take me in. That concept of seeking his face it's a motif that is through the Old and the New Testament. It conveys the idea of God's presence with us in grace and favour. Remember, he's with us always. As believers, he's with us always in his grace, with his grace and his favour. 
So David is saying, where are you, God, and where are those close to me? He's asking questions like this. Will you really deliver me? What have I done? And I think we've all asked those questions. But David says, but the Lord will take me in. For a long time, there was a verse I used to really tell, talk to myself with, give myself quite regularly, and that was Job 13, 15. A rough paraphrase says there, even though it feels like you failed me, God, yet will I trust in you. The Lord will take me in. Verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on level path because of my enemies. There's only two ideas here that I could grab. And the next one, the third one, is on the next slide, which is relating to the next idea. Teach me. Give me wisdom. Give me a level path. How do you respond when you are feeling attacked and fearful? The temptation might be to lie, to gossip, to develop a bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. That level path has that concept to me of righteousness, walking right before God, being truthful, not gossiping, forgiving and not carrying bitterness. That is a level path. Be my stronghold. This is the third idea in that group of verses. Give me not up to my enemies. This is verse 12. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. Um, I didn't realize when I chose this psalm that it related a little bit to me personally. And in 2.17, I marked this verse, this particular verse, uh, right there along verse 12 here. And I was in a work situation. I work in IT business software. I was in an IT project. That's what I do. That's my life. And I came to a point where I felt that I was being backstabbed at work and treated unfairly. And I was just distressed, overworked, burnt out, and didn't have a lot, a lot left in me at, at some points. Uh, Janine said, leave. <laughs> she was right. Should have left. Uh, I didn't always behave well in response to that. Sometimes I tried to, but sometimes I made stuff up. Uh, I think I made two mistakes, though. See, that project, I should say, it was, it was very much part of me. I don't fail. I, I'm, I, I'm a, I succeed. This is my thing. I want to be the hero. This was part of my identity, that project. I invested a lot, an enormous amount of hours and days and weekends into it. But I didn't consider the earlier verses in the psalm. One thing. My one thing was a project at the time. My one thing needed to be seeking after the Lord. So I made two mistakes. One is I didn't listen to my darling wife. <laughs> and secondly, I didn't make God my one thing. Now, five years later, that company ceased to exist. No one cares about that project. No one remembers that project. That project is gone. It is nothing. Important lesson to learn, isn't it? Listen to your wife and listen to God. <laughs> and read the whole context of all the verses as well. <laughs> so, there you go. That's what I'm going to say on that one. Then we come to verse 13. It's a real strong statement. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And We could ask, first of all, what is the land of the living? Is that here or is that in eternity in heaven? Because in many ways we actually live in the land of the dying because we all die. So it could be read either way, it's not clear. But either way, I believe I should look on the goodness in the land of the living. Now, in some Hebrew manuscripts, there's a little extra word which turns the sentence into an incomplete sentence. 
And it's not written this way in many versions, but the complete Jerusalem Bible writes it this way. And it puts an if there. If I hadn't believed that I would see God's goodness in the land of the living, I don't want to think about it. It's like an unfinished sentence. I don't want to think about it. I like both ways <laughs> in that verse. So it's worth considering it both ways. And then there's this command in verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Abraham waited 25 years for the fulfillment of the promise that he would have Isaac. We are instant coffee people if ever we were. <laughs> we want the answers now. I know I do. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. I do think that our modern Western culture has made us somewhat soft. And I do think we need to work at toughening ourselves up and encouraging ourselves, each other to be tougher. That's life. You won't escape situations that will bring fear. We need to believe in God's goodness and his plans for our lives, no matter what. And when all seems hopeless, yeah, you just got to hang there and hope. Hope in God as an anchor of the soul that reaches into eternity, into heaven. Three commands. Wait the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. So how do you deal with fear? Well, I've just grabbed some verses from the psalm, but read the whole psalm. Be cheerful and thankful in the face of challenges, for God is with us always. He will never leave us or forsake us. God can use fearful situations to strengthen our character. And when those fearful thoughts come, those real thoughts, where are you, God, I'm afraid, when you just keep focusing on the negative, take those to the cross. Lord, these thoughts are not from you. Read examples of people who have faced these situations. You may not all be in the era of Corrie ten Boom, who was in World War II in, a prison, in the Holocaust in the prison of war camp in, the, in Nazi Germany, but find her story and how she and her sister went to that camp and her sister died. It was a fearful situation. They protected Jews and they were taken to this concentration camp. If not Corrie ten Boom, find the stories of other heroes of our history like that. Uh, but take those fearful thoughts that they come, we all have them, to the cross and ask for the Lord's strength. And where will the Lord give you his strength? When you're dwelling in his word, trusting his word, reading less of the news, focusing less on the things of this world. If you spend all that time in the news and social media, it overshadows the word. Choose to believe. Sometimes it takes a choice, even when you're not feeling like it. Choose to wait and hope in God. Be courageous. Forget those past failures that we all have them. Step forward with wisdom. And in regards to the Holy Spirit giving us strength, remember Peter, the one that denied Jesus. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he's up there preaching the gospel. And 3,000 people are saved. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> and I read in Acts 4, verse 29, the believers prayed for boldness. That's almost a scary prayer, if you think about it. <laughs> I read this and thought, oh, I need to pray for boldness. And I thought, oh, that's a bit scary. <laughs> but I encourage us all to pray for boldness. The email... I mentioned earlier, <laughs> really needs wisdom to reply. I don't know how you put Psalm 27 in an email back. Um, and I'm on the other side of the world. I can only provide prayer support. That's the reality. But that's what we deal with. And maybe one day we might face the same situation as that believer or our children. Who knows?
your challenge. And I, I'm not a great believer at all in New Year's resolutions. I think they fail, mostly. <laughs> but pray for a heart to seek after God. Pray for a heart to seek after God because we're asking the Lord prayerfully to change our heart, to make us hungry. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon, 100 years ago, I don't know, I can't remember when he preached, but anyway, he's a famous preacher. Let the heathen rage, let the people and nations be moved, let the whole earth rock and reel, and the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. God is our refuge and strength, our very present help in time of trouble. God reigns, and the kingdom of Jesus is settled by an unchangeable decree. Therefore, lift up your heads, you saints, for your redemption draws near. And even now, clap your joyful hands and go back again to the conflict of life until your master calls you home like true heroes that henceforth shall know no fear and shall never turn your backs in the day of battle. God grant it may be so for his name's sake. Amen. So we're going to move into a time of communion now. Uh, I'll just finish that section in prayer and then we'll move on from that. Thank you. Heavenly Father, uh, we live in this world. We're placed, we're, we remain in this world, Lord.